Hey everyone, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Let's first dive right into another of the dungeon series, Howling Dell. This is by Jalee Johnson, and that name I actually feel pretty confident about. How? Because <laughs> Jalee actually has a website that she keeps up to date which is pretty nifty. Uh, got some information on what she's working on now. And one of the FAQ uh, questions, uh, one of the FAQs is how to pronounce her name, which a lot of the other authors who have their own website don't answer. So I was pretty excited about that. So I feel darn confident about that. Another thing that she has on there is her email address, and I figured what the hell emailed her, and she was up for some questions. So... I have some answers to some of the questions that I have to ask about this. First, let's just talk a little bit about the book. So it, it's about a dungeon called the Howling Delve, although it's also kind of sort of about uh, a revenge story that takes place in Om. Um, the Delve is really kind of more background and a set piece for most of the climax. It's essentially three books in one. As I said, the revenge... Uh, first, we have the setup for the revenge book, which is like the first third of the book. Then we have the mercantile mystery book. And it's also a dungeon crawl. This is like what Raymond Feist does over a period of seven books jammed into 311 pages. It does suffer, I think, because overall I feel there's too much going on and not enough depth, especially with some of the side characters. And and everyone comes across as pretty two-dimensional, except the kind of sort of main villain, Aizen, or Aizen, I don't know how that's pronounced, but he comes across as, like, beautifully three-dimensional, and he's very interesting. Um, and it's not that everybody else is boring, they're just kind of like... It, it does what's on the tin, right? My biggest frustration with this book was that a third of the way in, like literally almost on page 100, there's a chapter that feels like it should be the first chapter. And it's kind of, the first 100 pages fills you in on basically our two main characters, uh, one of which is, is doing the revenge story, and one of which came from the Howling Dell, the dungeon. That's where her background was. And on page 100, we have what feels like the, uh, uh, it, it's kind of the present day, it feels like the book starts there, and I really felt like everything else should have been flashbacks. I asked Julie if there was ever a draft of the book that included, or that started at that point, and everything else was flashbacks, and then it got rearranged chronologically for whatever reason. Her response was, As I recall, the idea was to present the Delve as this nightmarish place that had impacted the lives of several different characters through time and in a way connected to their lives. You know, that didn't really directly answer my question, but I think we can infer from that that no, the the it was always kind of like I'm I'm gonna start with the ways that it's impacted different people or or I guess rather she starts with the way that it impacts one character and then you have the kind of necessary setup of background for the other character who becomes involved in her life because essentially they're they're part of the same adventuring group. And then we see in the last third of the novel how all of that adventuring group and people from the revenge stories past <clears throat> past become involved in uh, the the howling delve by the end. I also asked her uh, how this process came about because I was curious. You know, for these uh, dungeons, wizards, etc. novels, was it just that they were working with authors already on ideas, and it was like, oh, you know we've got like four that involve dungeons pretty heavily. Let's ask the authors to pimp that bit up a bit and we'll kind of make a series out of it. Or was that the idea from the beginning? Or was it that, you know, like Jalee or Debbie offered stories that didn't really involve dungeons so much and they were like, well, we can't publish this story, but if you set it in a dungeon or, you know, whatever. She responded... I auditioned to write the novel knowing that it was to be in, that it was intended to be part of a series of four novels in the dungeon series. The guideline was that the novel had to involve a dungeon of some sort in a significant way. 
Well, it certainly achieves that. The uh, the last third or so of the book almost entirely takes place in the dungeon. And, uh, I don't know, what, maybe 10-20% of the uh, the beginning does as well. Or uh, 10-20% of the novel in the beginning does as well. So there you go. If anybody was curious, uh, it, it sounds as if they uh, held auditions. I'm not sure exactly how, because this is Jalee's first Realms novel, and so I'm not sure how she knew to audition, if that come through agents, etc., etc., etc. You know, I, I obviously could have uh, kept asking questions all through the day and night here, but I, I limited it to five because I figured that seemed like a manageable amount and I didn't want to take up tons of her time. Also, another question that I had for her was in in relation to the kind of um, two-dimensionality of a lot of the characters in the adventuring group, because it, it felt odd to me that she gave nearly a hundred or basically a third of the book over to two of the characters in this adventuring party, and then the last two-thirds of the book were just kind of supposed to accept them as an adventuring party, which to me felt strange, especially when there's a death and it hits someone else in the party really hard, but it's like, we don't really know these characters at all, so I feel a little odd here. So I asked her, you know, because this happened close to the end of uh, third edition, pretty much. This this book came out in 2007, I believe. The, the change over the fourth started happening in 2008. And but, you know, who knows who knows who knew what at that time. And so I asked her, you know, was the idea or was the hope that uh, this might branch out into other books? Because obviously we've seen that happen before. Right. I mean, uh, you know, Shadow's Witness was one of the Sembia books, which were all supposed to be standalone, though tied together more than like a dungeons or cities. And uh, we've seen characters from there, uh, besides Shadow's Witness, uh, Tazzy also appeared in that other book, which was, I think, like not a city's book, but I think it was something uh, as well, maybe a priest book or whatever. Uh, so we've seen that kind of branching out before, so I wondered, you know, was that the idea here to really fill in a few characters and then hope for sequels in which to deal more with these characters? Like, for instance, Crypt of the Moaning Diamond gave me that impression as well, that uh, Rosemary Jones really wanted to do a sequel or more with these characters. Julie said, each of the four novels in the series was intended to be a standalone, so there were no plans for a sequel that continued the characters' stories. Which is surprising to me, but, oh well, you know, uh, that's what, uh, that's, that's the way it goes, right? Also, I asked her if, the, if there were one thing that you could change, what would it be? And she said, basically, it's been such a long time uh, since she wrote it that she can't think of anything, which makes sense. But I just thought, you know, again... And what I told her is, you know, I'm looking at things from more of an editorial standpoint, and I think everybody's gotten that impression so far, right, uh, that that we're looking at it as kind of why were these choices made specifically, and in the broader picture, how did those choices help or hinder it becoming a part of the larger tapestry of the realms? So I felt that was a really important question to ask, but I totally get, you know, it was it was one novel that she wrote seven years ago now, probably wrote it eight years ago now, so... Uh, totally get that. And the other question that I asked, uh, because I do audiobook work and the Realms books came out as uh, audiobooks at the end of 2013, so I asked her if they got in touch with her uh, about pronunciations and things like that and if she'd had a chance to listen to it and what she thought. She said, I haven't had a chance to listen to the finished product, but I was contacted by audiobook narrators for, pronunci for, for pronunciation guidance. They also wanted to make sure they knew how to pronounce my first name, so they did not bother going to her website. <laughs> I would I would love to find out from Wizards how they chose the narrators, and I'm really curious to find out, like, uh, you know, you've probably seen that there are some of those uh, uh, Best of the Realms or, uh, uh, you know, things like that where they collect stories from previous pub previously published things, and I've noticed a couple of those where the original story is from one or one narrator and the best of is from another narrator. And it's like, so did they literally re-record the same story uh, in some cases? Because that just seems, you know, as someone who uh, records and produces audiobooks, I'm like, that's like damn near an extra day, like, given over to that. Uh, that seems weird to me. But whatever. I mean, you know, they're money, obviously, right? 
Also, I'd be very curious uh, to find out because, you know, uh, Realms Fiction, especially now, seems very, very concerned in the uh, meta world of uh, with pulling back and not spending as much money, not putting as much into producing as many products and having things a little more laser focused. You know, I, I think in in this entire like year cycle not not starting exactly at 2014 but in like a year cycle we're basically just getting the sundering and maybe a salvator book or two and like that's it so i'd be very interested you know they obviously sunk some money and time into recording all those audiobooks so it's like well did those releases pay off i hope they did because obviously I want audiobooks to flourish, because <laughs> that's part of my paycheck. And uh, on the other hand, I want the realms to flourish. So, hope, hope, hoping that that does well. Has anybody out there listened to any of the audiobooks? I've, I've listened to some of the uh, Drizzt audiobooks, because that was just... I had so many of them in a row there towards the beginning, and I wasn't super into them, but I felt it was important to read them because there are so many of them. And it was kind of an easy way to uh, just pop them in the car, listen to them on the way to work or, you know, whatever, and read other stuff at home. And that way I could kind of get through things a little bit faster and more easily. And they were fine, but they didn't blow me away. Um, so I'm just curious if anybody has listened to them, if anything stands out. Like, for instance, the the Robert Jordan Wheel of Time audiobooks, I think, are really exemplary exa- uh, of how audiobooks can be done really, really well. So just curious if anybody has had that sort of experience with any of the Realms audiobooks. You know, even stuff that we haven't covered yet, like stuff way beyond. And obviously, any of the Realm stuff that hasn't been done so far, <laughs> anybody at, uh, at Wizards, feel free to contact me. I would be happy to do those on the cheap for you. So since Julie was nice enough to answer my questions, I'm going to do a little bit of pimping for her. She's got a new young adult series out. It looks like the first of it is called Mark of the Dragonfly. Go to juliejohnson.com. You can find out more. And, you know, especially if you are one of those people who was into the realms when you were younger and now you're a parent parent, and you'd like to get uh, your child started into fantasy uh, early, it looks like it would be a really good way, and Julie writes uh, uh, well. Uh, So, yeah, and we'll see more from her. I'm excited to read more of it because, I'll admit, Howling Dell felt a little rough at places, uh, but it showed a lot of promise, and, uh, and the characters that she did delve into no pun intended there um uh, i i really enjoyed the way that she did it and uh it, it it sucked me in from the beginning for our second book today let's take a look at shadow storm the second book of the twilight trilogy by paul s kemp let's first of all uh, you know so the air of Kale trilogy the second book i felt was kind of the weakest of the lot and i was eh, underwhelmed by it so i was a little bit worried well we're gonna get to this one is it gonna feel the same way thankfully no let's get the negatives out of the way first i was a little bit sad that there weren't any more references to other realms books that i got because i was so impressed with the first one that he was able to tie so much in this one pretty much is just its own story you know still obviously like variance is there and uh, other things are mentioned etc 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 but it's really its own story this is, in fact, the opposite, I would say, of book two of uh, the Erebus Kale trilogy. You know, it's kind of it's kind of the same in the sense that our main characters, if you will, because even though this book obviously doesn't do this, it still feels to me as if uh, Riven and Erebus and Mags are our main characters because, of course, they, they carry over, right? But I would say it has about as much plot with them as the second book of the Erebus Kale trilogy. However, in this one, they're very much meant to be a side plot. The, the main plot is the Brewing War. Oddly, the Shadow Storm is not the main plot. That happens on literally, I believe, the last six pages or so and not where you think it's going to happen. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to see the fallout from that until Shadow Realm. The most interesting character in this book by far, I think, I I guess not character, but relationship between characters, is the Ribbelin Tamlin 
interaction, which I think it's interesting because in many different interviews, uh, which I don't have one with Paul, I did write to him but got no response. Who knows? Hopefully we'll get one uh, at a later point. I'd love to pick his brain a little bit about this series. But in, in many interviews, he's often said that his... He, he feels like his strongest thing is creating characters, and that uh, that's why, for instance, Resurrection, I think, is the Spider Queen book that he wrote, was a little difficult for him because it was almost entirely characters that other people had created, and so he had to rely solely on his ability to tell plot and story and et cetera, et cetera. And he, he feels like creating characters is his strongest point. However, the Rivlin... Tamlin interaction is so wonderful, and neither of those are his creation. I I believe Rivlin is is the Shadow Prince who showed up the most in Troy Denning's trilogy, Return of the Archwizards, though I could be wrong because honestly, they felt very interchangeable. Whereas now Rivlin and Brennus and uh oh not Variants, but the uh the other one, uh or maybe it is Variants, uh she's not a prince yet, but you know, uh, they they feel very distinct. They have their own personalities. And the uh, Rivlin-Tamlin thing, it's so like Godfather 2, man. It's just like, you, you know where this is going to end. You know where it's going. You know it's getting darker and darker. And you feel like kind of this schadenfreude being pulled along into someone else's misery. And it's so wonderful. And I'm really excited to see where that ends up. I hope it's not just Tamlin becomes a shade, Erebus has to take him down the end, you know? I mean, that's... Uh, I hope that there's more to it than that, that it's, that it's left kind of open to interpretation at the end, because I, I think that would feel uh, a little weak, but I don't know. I mean, I, I'll, I'll see how Paul handles it in the third book. The big thing about this book, I think, is that honestly... It, it it doesn't quite get to that level of, like, George R. R. Martin's Song of Ice and Fire or, you know, Steven Erickson where you have that large of a cast of characters, but I was reminded of that at certain points. It took me, I think, somewhere close to half the book to really get a grasp on all the different plot lines that are unspooling through here. Because we have the Ribble and Tamlin, we have everybody related to that, we have more of the crazy chick and her aunt who are starting the war, we have uh, these priests of Lathander who are... Uh, that storyline, wow, that didn't go in the way I expected it to, and I'm really happy about that. We have uh, the Erebus, uh, Riven Mags uh, storyline... And, and and then all these things that kind of unspool around all of those stories. It, it just... Tons of stuff happening. Like, non-stop. Like, this book really didn't stop much to catch its breath. I think it did a, a little in the first third or so. But once everybody's story kind of kicked in, it really, really kicked in. Not so much non-stop action until you know, the last third or so of the book. And honestly, that was probably my least favorite part of it because it was just kind of like, you know, there's some action scenes where you really feel either A, just completely invested enough that you want to read them, or B, you honestly don't know how it's going to turn out, and, and that keeps you reading. My problem with a lot of Realm stuff is it feels like there's kind of action scenes thrown in to have action scenes. And this suffered a little bit because of that, I think. Uh, much like the first book where I felt the weakest parts were the um, the necessary war-starting fights, in, in this one I felt it, it was a little bit similar because you kind of knew how all of the, uh, the, the main fights were going to go down. Unlike, for instance, the Lathander plot where it was like, I, I really thought it was going to go one way, both when Riven and Kale do the rescue because of stuff that Kemp has said in other interviews, and after that, once he comes back, it just felt like it, it went in a way that's, I don't want to say darker, but less hopeful <laughs> than the realms normally go in. So I'll be uh, very interested to see what sort of resolution comes with those characters. There are so many plots going on in this that I could talk about plot, plot, plot forever, 
getting back to our big notion of how does this, you know, does this make this feel like the realms? I, I think, honestly, this is the series almost more than anything else since probably Return of the Archwizards, where it really feels like, oh my god, everything's connected, it all means something. And I, I don't think that's necessary. I don't want to make it feel like I'm saying that stuff is better, but it's exciting when it comes along. You know, it's it's like watching first season of X-Files or Fringe or whatever, and and and... You know, hopefully you're enjoying every episode that comes out, but when you get an episode where you feel like, I am rewarded for having watched all these other episodes, even the ones that weren't necessarily amazing, or even the ones that felt like they had nothing to do with anything, that's really nice, you know? I, I it, it's, it's a little bit more satisfying, which of course doesn't need to be the case. Again, you know, you, you have a good X-Files episode that has nothing to do with anything, and you can still enjoy it. You, it possibly even has more shelf life. But that doesn't mean that these aren't really, really fun. Next time, it looks like we're going to wrap up a couple of trilogies here. Uh, Vanity's Brood and Shadow Realm on the plate for next time, and that should finish out this block, I believe. Until then, this is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remember.